We are delighted and honored to be joined once again by Professor Joan Mellon of uh, Temple University in Philadelphia. And she, of course, is the author of this landmark study, A Farewell to Justice, and the second edition with 90 pages, I believe, of additional material has uh, appeared and is uh, available. And I would urge people to uh, to make this your starting point or at least a, a key point of reference in any study you want to do of the Kennedy assassination and related problems. Because as a historian, I would always say the best bet for getting a good analysis of anything is a historical presentation, a genetic history. And here through uh, her experience and analysis of the garrison investigation, you get how this problem unfolded itself before the eyes of the world. So, again, very happy to be joined by Joan Mellon. Now, Joan is just back from Dallas, um, and we want to get her to talk about that. But now, Joan, the, the one thing uh, after all the stuff we saw, right, there was a CNN special, there were a million specials, CBS had their four days of coverage on their website, C-SPAN had days of NBC coverage on C-SPAN. Uh, ultimately, uh, who did this? And, and as you have said in, in many appearances, it's the CIA, it's specifically the uh, operations director of the CIA. Can you, just as a starting point, a benchmark, to lay down how did this come about? Who did it? In other words, who's the culprit, as, as best we can tell? Well, it's a pleasure to hear you again, Webster. I don't know where to start. I, one of the things, we really start with Jim Garrison, because when Jim Garrison looked at Oswald in New Orleans and he saw with whom Oswald was associating, he said, not only, I think I might have said this on the last program, not only was Oswald not alone assassin, as the Warren Report said, but everyone he was with was with CIA. More recently, a person who had been I guess you could call it involved with a CIA proprietary, said to me that it was a certainty that CIA had foreknowledge of the Kennedy assassination. And that's as far as he would go. So I don't think we, we can say who was the person whose bright idea this was. And because we don't have that piece, I urge everyone to read Don DeLillo's novel Libra, where DeLillo postulates that among the planners, he has one fictional planner, and he has one person that is a spitting image of David Atlee Phillips, who was in the uh, clandestine services, and his name appears beginning with, I suppose, the coup in 1954 in Guatemala. So there's a history of CIA overthrows of elected officials, and the same people then turn to uh, what they call the uh, CIA's executive action capability, and they turn it on our own president and the head of state here. I don't think there's any other sponsor of the CIA, of the assassination more obviously connected than CIA. And of course, they're involved in the cover up, and and they're really everywhere. When when the House Select Committee did its investigation, CIA was looking over their shoulders and informing the committee and the lawyers for the committee what questions they were allowed to ask witnesses and what. Uh, and, and, and what time period they were allowed to cover. And when Gaten Fonzie, who was the chief investigator for the House Select Committee, sat there watching the de 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 uh, Bernardo de Torres being deposed, he said to himself, of all the hundreds of thousands of Cubans you would in, in Florida, you would never have thought why, they, why the House Select Committee chose this guy. So heavily sanitized was the interview. Bernardo de Torres, I'll just remind the listeners, was one of the people, the two Cubans who visited Sylvia Odio in, uh, in September of 1963 with a person named, quote, Leon Oswald. And uh, Bernardo de Torres, who went under the pseudo then of Leopoldo, who then called Sylvia Odio and said, I just really wanted to tell you this, Leon Oswald, he keeps talking about how some Cuban should kill President Kennedy because of the Bay of Pigs. And Bernardo de Torres was a veteran of the Bay of Pigs invasion and also was heavily connected to CIA. The documents are available, really seems also to show us, just that figure alone, to show us how CIA was so close to the implementation of the assassination. All right, and just a, a couple of notes. Now, David Atlee Phillips, the uh, readers of my book, uh, The Unauthorized Biography of George H.W. Bush, the Elder, they know David Atlee Phillips as the, uh, 
the head of this FEO, uh, Association of Former Intelligence Operatives, I think. And they're very big in favor of George H.W. Bush back in, uh, in 1980, 1984. That's very also- interesting, Webster, because, of course, after Phillips... Phillips had retired, quote-unquote, from the agency. He set up this organization that you're talking about, the, this Association of Retired Intelligence Officers. Right. And it's, it's very fitting. I, I, haven't, I, I don't recall that, but it's very fitting that they should protect George H.W. Bush, who had a long history of being an asset of CIA, of lending his operations for CIA uses, just as the person who brought George H.W. Bush to Texas, uh, Neil Mallon, the CEO of Dresser Industries, and that was the first person who employed George H.W. Bush when he moved to Texas, was also using his organization as cover for CIA operatives. So really, they're all, as Don DeLillo says in another novel called Underworld, they're all connected. Everything is, everyone is connected. And I, I would just point out that my biography of George H.W. Bush, unfortunately not the printed edition where this was censored by the, uh, the publisher, but what you can find online uh, I go through uh, George H. W. Bush as the one of the prime organizers of the Bay of Pigs attack, and then as somebody who shows up in the address book of George de Morinschild, this white Russian CIA Eastern European. Now you know that I wrote a book about George de Morinschild called Our Man in Haiti, and it picks up George de Morinschild's life. It gives a summary of his life and picks up where. George de Morinchil bids farewell to Lee Harvey Oswald, his charge in Dallas and Fort Worth, and, and uh, takes up with uh, Clemar Joseph Charles, a Haitian backer who hoped that CIA would overthrow Papa Doc, Francois Duvalier, and put him in as the president of the Republic of Haiti. And there's de Morinchil, so I, I trace what de Morinchil was doing in Haiti. People often ask, well, why was de Morinchil in Haiti? And so I called that book Our Man in Haiti using the Graham Green locution, right. two Graham Green locutions. One is, okay, Our Man in Haiti, George de Morinchil, and CIA in the Nightmare Republic, because uh, the Haitians hated that. But uh, uh, Graham Green wrote an, a book about Haiti called The Comedians, one of his entertainments, and uh, I got that phrase from there. The nightmare it was really a nightmare republic during the time of Duvalier. Well, certainly. Uh, but now, uh, concerning de Morinchil, this is also somebody who was uh, liquidated right before he was going to testify to the House Assassinations Committee, I believe. That's true, Webster, because I found one of my sources on Haiti was a man who had a Kenaf uh, plantation. Now, Kenaf is an uh, a plant that's used that's in place of jute, which made ro- which makes rope. And that was named, his name was Joseph F. Dreyer, Jr., and he got to know everyone, including George de Morinchild in Haiti. So I interviewed Dreyer, and I wanted to talk to him about de Morinchild, and he told me something really remarkable, and that was that uh, the day before de Morinchild's death, George de Morinchild called Dreyer up on the phone, they knew each other from Haiti, and said, uh, let's have lunch, and I have something I want to tell you, I want to talk to you about something. And uh, a dryer was very busy and <laughs> said, well, I can't do it today, George. How about tomorrow? Mm-hmm. And de Morinchil said, fine. And uh, they made a date. He gave Dreyer the instructions for how to get to the house where de Morinchil was staying. Now, would George de Morinchil have made a date for lunch the next day and then killed himself that, that same day, an hour after he made the date with Dreyer? It's inconceivable. Plus, of course, there were no shells for the gun that was uh, found in the in the house there. There was no ammunition. Plus, Dreyer said the maid heard a car driving away shortly after the event. This has never been reported. I was amazed. It just I didn't realize when I went to interview Dreyer that he knew about how George DeMorne shall die. Okay, our music indicates one of those hard breaks, but now we'll be back in a couple of minutes and uh, more with Joan Mellon, the author of A Farewell to Justice, The Garrison Investigation, the starting point for a serious overview of the uh, of this topic. Back in a minute. Back to more We're talking to Joan Mellon, the author of A Farewell to Justice. This is our at least our interim uh, wrap-up on the Kennedy uh, 50th uh, anniversary. Uh, I, w- I would just point out the, the attempt to send uh, Oswald to Cuba, looks it looks like an attempt to sheep-dip him, right, so that you'd have the possibility of blackmailing uh, Cuba, right, saying they did it. But concerning, concerning the CIA side, right, David Atlee Phillips, number one, 
How about James Jesus Angleton? Wasn't he the head of that program under which Oswald was sent to the Soviet Union? That's right, Webster. So we so that's another CIA surfacing in this story, because certainly Oswald uh, was not a Marxist. We don't we we don't have time to go into proving that, but we could easily do it. It was a, a program that James Angleton headed, uh, a part of CIA counterintelligence called False Defectors, entering the Soviet Union. And Russians saw through it instantly, and uh, it was just really quite a farcical event because Oswald tried to return his passport to an officer at the uh, American consulate who was the CIA himself, Richard Snyder, and the documents have surfaced there. And the, another thing about Snyder, and I don't remember if we talked about this on an earlier program, Snyder uh, denied that he ever had anything to do with CIA, but in fact he was CIA's recruiter at Harvard University, Harvard College, and one of the people that Snyder tried to recruit was Sidney Brzezinski, now, whether or not Brzezinski was recruited, I don't know. The document trail stops there. But that uh, Snyder found him an ideal recruit, there's no doubt. Those documents are available. Now, since you bring this up, is this the same Snyder who then ended up as U.S. ambassador to the Philippines, I believe? I don't think so. I don't know. But uh, I, I can't be sure. Be Richard E. But... Snyder. No, uh, Richard E. S- I don't know that for a fact. All right. I don't know. Maybe but, uh, Stigner was already working for somebody else. Anyway, I think we've covered the CIA. Now, you also make the case that he's an agent of the customs, U.S. customs. Well, there's an interesting uh, story. Uh, Oswald was seen in the, in the company of offices of U.S. Customs and the uh, Immigration and Naturalization Service in New Orleans, and this was rep- one of the uh, I, uh, Immigration and Nat- Naturalization Service officers, whose name was Wendell Roche, was uh, subpoenaed by the church committee, and he said, I've been waiting 12 years for somebody to talk to me, somebody to ask me about Oswald. So Roche went to testify to the church committee, and we have the summary of his testimony, but the, tes- the, the transcript of the actual testimony, both of him and of David Smith of U.S. Customs, have vanished. And during the late 1990s, people who were working for the Assassination Records Review Board, ARRB, went and looked and saw what, what transcripts were still available that hadn't been released. And these customs and immigration testimonies had vanished. They're no longer there, and so we cannot expect to see them in 2017. The other witness who saw Oswald in the company of the customs officers was the owner of a bar of co- called, uh, I think it's called the Cabana Bar, and Cabana Bar named Orestes Peña, and we have a document showing that the files on Peña, even in Rome, as far away as Rome, were destroyed, and the Church and HSCA testimonies of Pena have also been uh, unable, we're unable to locate them. So the, this was very sensitive. Certainly the government did not want Oswald to be emer- to emerge as really a person utilized by several intelligence services of working for the United States. Let me ask you one more. Now, I've just, I've just been re- rereading uh, Edward J. Epstein inquest, and even in there he has that the, the Warren Commission was certainly aware or they had reports that Oswald was an FBI informant paid $200 uh, a week or a month or whatever it was. A month. But I I think, uh, yes, that's true, because it emerged in the executive uh, sessions of the Warren Commission. They couldn't conceal it. And uh, uh, I have a lot of information in A Farewell to Justice about Oswald's relationship with the FBI in New Orleans. His handler was... A person I found very, uh, one of the most brilliant men I'd ever met. He was never the special agent in charge in New Orleans. His name was Warren DeBruis, and he certainly Did was not Did you say his last name again, or maybe spell it for us? Ah, uh, that good. It's a Huguenot name, D-E, and then B-R-U-E-Y-S. And I, when I, the first minute I went in there, I said, how do you pronounce your name? Because nobody gets it right, <laughs> except for people from Europe. And so he said, so that's why I'm confident in saying De Bruyne. Mm-hmm. And he was, he was a Huguenot, and his ancestor, he actually told me, had fought Lord Nelson at, mm-hmm. at some sea battles. So he's very proud of that. He's an, an extraordinarily charming, civilized, educated man. He was a lawyer. In those days, you had to be a lawyer, usually, to get, it, get into the FBI. And he was the person whom the FBI sent to Dallas on the day after the assassination to begin to compile a file on Lee Oswald. 
and Mr. De Bruce knew everything. And he, and within a week, I think he, 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 we had the thousand pages of of commission documents, seventy five, all kinds of interviews with people in New Orleans, all kinds of information that they suddenly had on Lee H. Oswald. But normally, when you look into this FBI side, you get this character called Hasty, who's the one who burns Hasty's in Dallas. Burns and Hasty is in. Hasty is in that, I'm sorry. That that Oswald had written them a note saying, "Stop harassing my family, or I'll blow you up, or something." Hasty, uh, Oswald left the note, and uh, then the FBI flushed it down the toilet. <laughs> So right. that note has uh, never appeared, but Hosty, yes, went to the house and was asking about Oswald. That was in Dallas just shortly before the uh, assassination. All right. Now, with all this wealth of material, I mean, we've done CIA, Customs, FBI. Is there any other agency that stands out? Because this is already a lot. <laughs> That's a lot. I don't know who else exists. All right. Now, of course, the Office of Naval Intelligence somewhere oh. lurks here because Oswald was in a Marine, which is part of the uh, Navy. But I think really, that really, it was uh, largely CIA. He was a CIA. And when you're with CIA, everyone else takes second place. I had uh, a very interested in uh, Colonel Edward Lansdale, who was uh, seems to be in the Air Force and right. wore a uniform, and was a military officer all his life, and, and uh, yet, in fact, was CIA all his life. And we only know that because, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier either, we only know that because toward the end of his career, Lesdale wanted a promotion from his superiors at the Pentagon, supposedly, and um, they said no, they didn't think he was worthy of it, and then Alan Dulles wrote a letter to the Pentagon, and Lansdale became Brigadier General Lansdale on as he retired. So we can see CIA there really uh, using the military for cover and really in, in influencing the decision-making. But one of the things CIA wanted, whether it was State Department cover, military cover, corporate cover, and that is you have a complete cover. So your biography, if anybody looked into your file, you would be, for example, Lansdale, you'd have a complete military record with military numbers, and, and you would look on paper, surely, as if you were in the military. CIA was very careful about how the covers were organized. And certainly the Lansdale is, I think, broadly, I mean, at least among the community researchers, this is the classic case of the CIA general. But now, moving on, you have just completed the round of all of these uh, conferences, and I'll just tick them off at the beginning of the next segment. So what we're hoping to hear is the distilled wisdom or direction in the field that has come out of these events since you're, you're an eyewitness of, of all of them, really. So we'll be right back with Joan Mellon, author of A Farewell to Justice. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. It's our uh, post-Thanksgiving broadcast, and we're wrapping up the developments on the uh, Kennedy anniversary, the Kennedy uh, assassination uh, front, and we're talking to Joan Mellon. She's the author of A Farewell to Justice, Jim Garrison, JFK's assassination, and the case that should have changed history, which we highly recommend. Now, Joan has just attended the Cyril West uh, Conference. She's attended the Ryder University uh, Oliver Stone Conference, the Lancers uh, Conference in Dallas, and the COPA Conference. And I wonder, out of all of these presentations and events, if anything stands out that people need to be aware of me and it really did because the media and all the coverage of the 50th anniversary almost never mentions Jim Garrison but at every one of these conferences Garrison was really the figure that stood out it was amazing to me not only particularly from Oliver Stone because Oliver Stone was promoting his series the untold uh, unknown histories or uh, and uh, didn't talk so much about Garrison but on the day that I spoke Mark Lane spoke first and then I spoke with so, and then uh, uh, Bob Tannenbaum spoke, who was the deputy counsel for the House Select Committee, who left, of course, once CIA took over the investigation under Robert Blakey. But really, these are, to me, these, these were absolutely the high points. And uh, every, everything else, it look, as I look at it, really, you may be, you know, I'm not saying this in a self-serving way, took second, uh, took second place. For example, at the WEC conference, the so-called keynote speaker was someone called Larry Sabato from University of oh. Virginia. 
and he gave this speech about how the acoustic evidence was no good, and therefore the House, implying that the House Select Committee's conclusion that there was a conspiracy was in doubt. And this was, and everybody just sort of looked at each other. He was pathetic, and uh, you know, we just we knew we didn't know anything about the case. He didn't know, for example, that the questions about the acoustic evidence had been, you know, sort of discussed and analyzed years and years ago. He pretended that this was something new. And this is uh, what several people seem to have done, reviving old ideas and thinking and pretending that they're discovering something that had long been debunked. So that was the keynote there. I think that uh, the, the, the CIA came to the forefront in, at, all the other, at all the other events. Uh, and uh, I was... Uh, when uh, we had the speeches about... Uh, we had some about George H. W. Bush, but that was that was also old stuff. Nothing really new. And also, I have to say that one of the things that stands out in some of these conferences is people who steal the research of other people and don't give them credit look shameful. And I'm thinking about the George H. W. Bush material and the George de Mornshield material that has come forth without proper credit being given to the person who wrote 11 volumes on George de Mornshield, which is a writer named Bruce Adamson, who did extraordinary research, which I use myself in Our Man in Haiti, and which uh, uh, others have used, at least I gave Bruce credit in the text, in the text, not just in the notes. And, uh, I don't know. That's it. Stand, I think these conferences sort of exist to also to keep people honest. So I was uh, happy about that. Uh, I don't know. I think that uh, on on the Friday. I don't know when you're airing this program, but the day after Thanksgiving, C-SPAN three is going to air the second day of the WEC conference, and. Uh, that's the day Mark Lane spoke, and I spoke, and Tannenbaum spoke, and Dan Alcorn, who's a Freedom of Information lawyer in Washington, led a panel. Rex Bradford was on it, who is the webmaster for the Mary Farrell site. And uh, I think that was uh, the best day, in, in my opinion. Sabato was the first day. And uh, one of the things that happened the first day, I think this is another thing. People don't read other people's research. I had interviewed Dr. Robert McClelland for a farewell to justice, and he's the doctor who held President Kennedy's head and so could testify that the back of his head was blown out and the cerebellum fell out, and, and it was clearly had, not, had, had to be a shot from the front. Well, Dr. McClelland was interviewed in my book, and then they had a tape of doc, uh, sort of a video of Dr. McClellan at the WEC conference and presented it as if this was the first time that Dr. McClellan was talking. It wasn't. And now he talked to me and he talked to others over the years. He's always been open and honest and has told us that when he went to the National Archives and looked at the x-rays and autopsy photographs that were there, he was appalled because he had been there holding President Kennedy's head and knew exactly what, what the what the wounds were and what, what happened. And uh, so that that occurred, and that was sort of nice to see Dr. McClellan on tape. But I had him in my book, and, no, of course, no one mentioned that and so forth. And uh, I don't know. I think that uh, these conferences, they have their limitations, let's put it that way. And I think, but at, at, at Lancer, I, I was amazed to see, so in the, in the people who came to the conference, so many questions about Jim Garrison, so much interest. I, I was, and many, many people came from the U.K. That was very unusual, too. I'd never seen so many people, visitors, and also from Italy and from Puerto Rico and all sorts of people from many, many places, uh, people from all over the country. That was really interesting. I suppose it was... Uh, homage to the 50th anniversary, but it was really uh, very, very special. All right, so now we get to see you on C-SPAN 3 on Thanksgiving weekend. This this program comes on on, uh, on Saturday, uh, about 2 o'clock in the afternoon is the first broadcast. So um, people have plenty of time to tune to C-SPAN, and of course, after, uh, after it's broadcast on the C-SPAN, it'll be up on the C-SPAN video archive, where I'm, I hope that everybody who goes to re- look at my lecture on the Russian fleets will also then go on to uh, to look at this. So that's the Cyril West, and that's so at this a is university? the conference in, from Pittsburgh, from the um, you know the Forensic Science Institute that he runs and that was sponsoring this uh, conference. But and of all the university? days, it was three days. I'm sorry. It, it's a university, isn't it? Um, Duquesne University. Duquesne. Right. There we it's go. Attached to Duquesne University. All right, so Joan will be on uh, C-SPAN 3 this post-Thanksgiving weekend. 
I also just wanted to point out the CNN two-hour special in the second hour did show extensive clips of Mark Lane arguing, I think maybe with Walter Sheridan or somebody like this. Certainly they showed an ample cut of Garrison, I think indicting the CIA. They had Harold Weisberg. They had a number of other people. So I thought for CNN that was somewhat better than the norm. Well, I didn't see it because I was still in Dallas, but uh, I, I'm glad to hear that because the first part of that, I gather, was all the pro-Oswald did it crowd right. of Bugliosi right. and Max Holland and Edward yes. J. Epstein and that group. Right, right. So it I don't was... think they had any current... I, well, I don't know. I didn't see it. But anyway, at least they, I'm glad to hear that they had Mark Lane because Mark Lane has really been steadfast in his conclusion that CIA, CIA was behind the assassination. And at the WEC conference, someone in the audience asked Mark Lane, well, who was it? Who did the shooting? And Mark Lane said, I, I don't have evidence, and so I can't name the names. And, you know, as a defense attorney, you don't accuse people unless you have the evidence, as far as individuals go. But, of course, for a historian, it's not quite that way. So now we can say, and I would say as a historian, the CIA is the absolute prime suspect, and the, the whole thing is inconceivable without it. Now, just in, in order to get into that terrain, we have all these theories, right? Now, you, your mastery of this stuff is, is unparalleled, so I wanted to try to get you to give us a quick verdict on, on some of these theories, right? If you want to mention who brings them up, that's fine. If not, then not. What's the essence of the theory, and above all, if it's baloney, why, why is it baloney? How about this idea that Lyndon B. Johnson is somehow the mastermind of the Kennedy assassination? Well, you know, that's a great one that you mentioned, Webster, because it's the most prevalent one. And in the last decade, book after book, including the recent one by Roger Stone, insists that Lyndon Johnson was the mastermind of the Kennedy assassination, that a figure named Mac Wallace was his hitman and was seen in the... Uh, sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository shooting, and I'm very interested in that myself because I'm just finishing a book about Mac Wallace, and I have to say that you, when you look at all those books, one thing they have in common is CIA is never mentioned at all. Okay, one second now. We're going to get you to stay with us if we can. I think we have one more segment. We want to use that to try to round out the picture, and we'll be back in just a minute. Welcome back to World Crisis Radio. We're already in our final segment on the uh, our post-Thanksgiving show. We wanted to talk a little bit about poverty and also about um, the effects of something like the uh, Obamacare in rural Kentucky, where it, you get a different uh, view of this. But um, certainly Larry Sabato, uh, Larry Sabato, and people in Virginia would, I think, say that his his area is will... Will uh, McAuliffe defeat Cucinelli or or the opposite? That's that's his uh, cup of tea. I don't see how he knows anything about the Kennedy assassination. But well, we're trying didn't. to we're trying to run through these theories now. So the first one we wanted Joan to comment on is the LBJ. Well, let me say this in general about all these theories, Webster, and that is CIA is really behind them. Whether in years past it was the mafia that they promoted, whether it was the KGB, which Richard Helms promoted that, and said that Garrison was really influenced by the KGB, and that's why he named Clay Shaw. Right. Whether it was Fidel Castro or whether it was Lyndon Johnson, all these, we get year after year a different sponsor. One thing that these sponsors have in common is false sponsors, I should call them. They're not CIA. And it's very interesting to look at the Lyndon Johnson did it books and see that there's never a mention of Oswald in New Orleans. They have to rule that out. They have to rule out Clay Shaw, David Ferry, Oswald in the company of CIA people. They have to rule out everything in Louisiana in order to come up with this theory that Lyndon Johnson, his lawyer, Ed Clark, and his right-hand man, um, now his name escapes me at the moment, Cliff Carter, Cliff Carter, uh, were really the only people involved, and with Mac Wallace, that is, in, uh, in, in creating the Kennedy assassination. That fact alone should let us know that uh, this is false. It's absolutely false. And I reinvestigated the fingerprint evidence. Mac Wallace was supposedly up there on the sixth floor of the school book depository, and I had to hire a uh, new certified latent print examiner, somebody who was an officer in the organization that does the certifying, to look at the prints of Mac Wallace when he was arrested once in Austin, his, 
Navy prints from the U.S. Marines, which were pristine, and then an un- unidentified print in the hands of the Warren Commission, which we got a photograph of from the National Archives. And look at these prints. Was he really there? Did, does this print prove that Lyndon Johnson, so-called henchman, serial killer, was really up there? And so I'm not going to answer that right now, but you can guess where the discussion mm-hmm. is going. But in past years, it was the mafia. And Rich, uh, Robert Blakey, after the House Select Committee was finished, wrote a book with Richard Billings saying he found some mafia figures and they were behind it. It's inconceivable. Now, we know that CIA used mafia figures from the day that the CIA was created in Italy under Project Gladio, Operation Gladio, to subvert the elections, the post-war elections in Italy, and to be sure that the Christian Democrats won and that coalition of communists and socialists lost. We know we know that mafia have been useful and instrumental and but always under the command of CIA, never did the decision-making. So once that theory was sort of watered down, forget it, then we had to have Lyndon Johnson. That was the new one, and that one has been going. This book by Roger Stone is absurd. And yet here we have another one come out this past month or so, saying saying these, and, and they never reinvestigate. They always repeat the, the, the same information as the previous book, where there's one by Phil Nelson, there was one called The Men on the Sixth Floor, and and all these Mac Wallace books uh, say the same thing. They never bother to re-examine the information. I don't know whether it's just laziness, I guess. The other thing that always strikes me as a student of the um, Wall Street uh, banking establishment, such a decision is 10 or 20 pay grades above the presidency. That is this... It's this naive notion that the president has real power, and that if something happens, the president must have done it. And this this is the most elementary um, fallacy. So I'm, I certainly agree with you. And I, I would just point out this guy, Tom Hartman, is the, another book about Hartman mafia. and well, Lamar Waldron and Hartman wrote a book called uh, Goodness, I, um, I can't remember, but it was it, uh, it was a, a book about you know the mafia and, and um, ultimate sacrifice. Sorry, there it is, right. ultimate sacrifice. And 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 that one, but then that went by the boards. But that book came out simultaneously with a farewell to justice. So you can see the the CIA's met. They didn't. Many people ask me, "Well, did CIA hurt you? Did they kill you? Whatever? Did they try to kill you?" But uh, this, what they do is they 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 sponsor a book that says that uh, the opposite of what you're saying. And I think CIA also had to have. And this is pure speculation. But they had to have sponsored Bugliosi's book, Reclaiming History, thousand page book published by. W. W. Norton, and no, no big publisher these days publishes books of that length. And in in that book on, on the CD-ROM that's stuck on the side of it is a vicious attack on me. And the leading libel lawyer, lawyer in New York, Martin Garbus, who's actually a First Amendment guy, but he was willing to take the case and fight Bugliosi. The only thing is, I couldn't afford it, so I had to let it go. He would have, and he we tried to raise the money. And uh, he would have said he would have enjoyed fighting Bugliosi on the courtroom, but it, it, that didn't. But it was clearly libelous. They don't really care what they do. They have, uh, they have higher authority behind them, and that's why Clay Shaw, in the Garrison case, could sit there in court and lie and perjure himself, knowing that he would be protected. He would not go to jail, no matter what he did. Right. So we have the well-known, I guess, Bugliosi, Posner. And then the, the favorite was, Time, was a Time magazine guy. is this McAdams, right? McAdams is the, the great hero of, of the Time magazine. Well, McAdams, you know, has been at it for years, attacking everybody who criticized the Warren report. We know who, we know who was working for whom. Let's put it that way. And he was he was at the WEC conference, and I was trying to find him, see, because I wanted to say something to him. But I, you know, he presented. He just didn't identify himself. I, I couldn't figure out which particular individual he was. I think I did find him, and I said, "Are you John McAdams?" And he denied it. And I think that was McAdams. <laughs> but there you go. He doesn't want to face us. He just uh, and if, and I saw the Time Magazine reporter, and I was hoping he, in a naive egomaniac that I became, I thought, oh, if only he would talk to me, I can you know tell my thoughts. And he didn't get it. He didn't go anywhere near me. And then just, but I think the, the, the yeah, the, the Castro and and Soviet KGB line. This I, I've heard this described as a dialectical cover up. In other words, there is something to it. That you, what you're doing is you're trying to build in a, a really extraneous elements, but they say if you probe this, you may get World War Three, right? For the first several years of it, at least. Well, Oswald was primed to right. be 
a person who was uh, uh, put up to it by Castro, and that's why Oswald was giving out Fair Play for Cuba leaflets in New Orleans in the streets in the summer of 1963, presenting himself as pro-Castro, and therefore on Castro's behalf, uh, it was, was you know would be would be blamed for killing President Kennedy. But it didn't work out because it's inconceivable that Castro would kill President Kennedy. Plus, w- uh, we learn that President Kennedy had sent various people to create a rapprochement with Castro. Now. Right. Kennedy presented a contradictory policy. On the one hand, rapprochement. On the other hand, continuing to participate, especially with Robert Kennedy and plots to assassinate Castro. But I think that the idea that because the the Kennedys were involved in, and the CIA also was involved in plots to kill Castro, doesn't mean that Castro would then plot to kill President Kennedy. I mean, it was, that's, that's really absurd. Right. Just because somebody else does something doesn't mean you do. And I, I can't imagine that Castro would ever have done such a thing. Now, in the limited time we have, the other, the other one that seems to be getting some play now is the Israelis did it. Any comments? Well, I heard that. that. Listen, Webster, I won't even listen to that. I was on a radio program, and somebody said... The Mossad was behind it. I said, what's the evidence? There's absolutely zero evidence for that. It sort of it looks like a, uh, I mean, I'm not a, I'm anti-Zionist, but I, I still would, I see no evidence whatsoever uh, for the Israelis getting involved in killing the American head of state. That's killing the cow that, what is the, what is the phrase? The goose that the golden, the golden egg. egg. Where, yeah, yeah. I, it's, it, I, I never, I mean, I, I wouldn't even grant that any credence whatsoever. I, I would say, I mean, based on people from the CIA that I have known myself, this the idea... Whenever something bad happens, one of the standard CIA lines is, we would never do that. That must have been the Mossad. John, I'm afraid we, we don't have time for the world historical um, animate version, but I think we've done a, a pretty good job in covering it. So we want to thank you, and we want to recommend that everybody get a farewell to justice. Jim Garrison, the JFK assassination, in the case that should have changed history by Joan Mellon, uh, Potomac Books. And thank you very much. No, no, much. Sky Horse. The new edition is Guy Horse Publishing. Guy Horse Publishing. Well, then, uh, uh, that that's the one. Get the new one with the extra 90 pages based on the on the last 20 years of documents. Thank you so much. Thank and you, happy Webster. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving to all, and we'll be back next week on World Crisis Radio.